here, right? In our formulation, remember, we are trying to maximize, we are trying to take our derivative such that we're good against this inner attack, right? So here, they, they kind of do it similar spirit, but roundabout way. They can write a similar algorithm, which I don't think it's very interesting if I write it down. I could, but, uh, let's see. Let me, let me actually not write it down, but you can imagine how you would modify this one in order to get this one, right? And theirs doesn't, I mean, they, they need to trick much more. Theirs doesn't work quite as well. They need to actually take the kernel, not at the end, but somewhere in the middle, so they introduce time, they have small badges, and it's, you know, it's, it's a little more pedestrian and less believable in the sense that they have to tune quite a bit to get to their thing. I don't want to make the, I mean, but it's, it's, it's a less robust result, I should say, in that sense. Um, but, uh, oh, here it is. Uh, but nonetheless, so they, that's from their paper. So here's uh, various approaches to how do I poison my data in order to get people to totally misclassify. I'm sure you've never thought about this problem, as I thought, it's kind of so roundabout. So there's various, uh, this is a GAN-based GAN kind of approach. This is RFA's, yet something else I, I forgot. Anyway, this is theirs, and these numbers indicate actually how far you train the kernel. So here, I only wrote down the kernel expression at the end of training. But you, you remember there is actually a kernel expression where you have an extra term, one minus e to the minus t times kernel. So that this is the t in the kernel. So they, they actually are not best at the end, they're somewhat best in the middle. It's a bit of a heuristic thing. But these are the perturbations that you get. When you I think this is kind of the best. So this is how you need to poison your data in order to prevent the thing from generalizing. Okay? All right. Okay, so um, let me come back. I, I want to finish that topic and still talk about the features a little more. Let me come back to features. So what I told you already is each time with these features, especially the non-robust ones, so the adversarial perturbations, I told you are very, people have observed, and also you can see an intuition, they transfer. So you produce an adversarial example with one model, it will tend to fool the other model as well, often, okay? And so what the first thing Nikos and I did is we wrote down an infinitely wide kernel, I mentioned this already yesterday, and we produced adversarial examples with that kernel, and you know, it does fool certain neural networks, that's nice. Uh, but then we wanted to take this a little bit further and see what can the neural tangent kernel really tell us about the features and, and generally uh, robust, um, robust training. And so, let me find my features. Oh, it's the other one, sorry. Um, right, so what we can do is we can basically Define, okay, so I'm, I'm glossing over a lot of things, and look at our papers, but when you have a kernel, right, our function fx is basically, as I keep writing down, is the kernel, this is the training set, xx minus one, y, okay? So this is the kernel evaluated at a test point, and you can do, of course, as, as is often done here, you can do a, eigenvalue decomposition, I'll come back to these eigenvalues, and then you can define, okay, so we want to define, remember how Madri had all defined features. They said, let's take this neural net and let's assume every neuron at the last layer is a feature. Fair enough? Well, we say, okay, we have a kernel, let's define something natural for kernels, let's define features on kernels. And we have seen this expression, I've tried to show you this expression several times through my talk, and each time, for instance, I said large eigenvalues correspond to low frequency, uh, large eigen, you know, uh, when the data is very much in the beginning of the spectrum, we learn it fast and so on. So I'm trying to relate you to this to all, all this knowledge also a little bit, right? So um, anyway, so we can decompose the kernel like this and then we can define features, of course, which is simply, you can look at it as, and you, you know, this is just operational, but it turned out to be useful. We can take this out here. Uh, we keep this kernel because we can't quite decompose it. And then we take this. Yeah. Right, so basically our function, you can, in that basis, you can rewrite it. And you call these things features. 
I mean, they're definitely featured by the definition that we just made as a function from the input to the output. These are our features by definition, okay? So each feature comes from one piece of the eigenspectrum. Fair enough, right? So we can do that. And this allows us, unlike Madri, who had to do this type of thing with robust and non-robust features, this allows us now to, as a first, you know, as a first step, let's see what these features give them, give us. So um, here's one adversarial example. It's a car. You perturb it. It becomes an airplane. And if you decompose now the gradient, you can also, I mean, I'm glossing again over many things, but you can also decompose that gradient here. This is presumably the, you know, usually you remember this is the sign of the gradient of perturbation of the PGD. You can decompose it in a similar way according to these features, right? And it kind of linearly decomposes, at least in the binary case. And you can look at the features and order them by eigenvectors, so eigenvalues, sorry. So this is the, what we call the top feature, the one corresponding to the first eigenvalue, the third, I don't know why Nikos left out two, but never mind, this is the third, this is the 25th, and so on. We can do that, right? I mean, it's nice. We can look at these features. Okay. Uh, and then one other thing uh, that we thought was interesting, we did this, these are all neural tangent kernel in the infinite Linux, so analytical ones. We did this for many architectures, many, the ones we could do, five, five layer convolutional 4321, uh, sorry, fully connected and two convolutional ones. And again, you visualize these features and they kind of all look the same. So which means, again, we can actually now see that these features transfer from architecture to architecture. So it's very, very robust. And not robust in the robust sense, but very uh, uniform in some ways, okay? So this is, uh, this is just visualization. And then here, um, now we can also, for each of these features, the way we wrote them here, we can, we can compute whether they're useful or not useful in the sense that do they correlate with the label or not, okay? And we can also compute whether they are robust or not robust by perturbing them and see if they're still correlated with the label, right? So we can actually uh, look at these features. And here, uh, this is, uh, again, Nikos did this. These are non-robust but huge, useful features that appear somewhere in the spectrum. I mean, I don't see anything, but uh, they are totally uh, non-robust. So think of it as being the sum of these last features in my in the example, uh, but they are useful. So that's nice. Um, here is a bit of a, um, a, a diagram. So here is the eigenvalues. So the, I hope you're, you can see the colors, right? So the more purplish it is, the lower the eigenvalue, okay? And then here is whether they are useful and whether they are robust, okay? So let's ignore the useful, but look at the robust ones. There's a very strong correlation between being early in the spectrum and being robust. Okay, so which also, if you think about how, remember I, I wrote down these formulas, how we learn training, uh, and we first kind of learn the stuff that's aligned with the top eigenvalues, and then we learn the stuff that's later. So again, this is an intuition why robust features are kind of learned first, and then we refine and we learn the non-robust stuff, and it screws us up later. I mean, I, everything, I'm not being very vague, but you can try to put some math in it by looking at these spectrum, relating it to stuff that you know. So this is both CIFAR and MNIST, but the take home message here is, first of all, they all exist. So they exist both robust and useful, robust and non-useful, I mean, all of that stuff exists. And, um, and uh, they, they align with the spectrum in this particular way. And this is both CIFAR and MNIST, there seems to be the same uh, take home message. So what did we, uh, so Nik Nikos likes these, or maybe I like these phrases, but so we say robust is light at the top. What that means is that the top eigenvalues, and if you think about it, so somebody came to me, I think it was, I don't know, whoever it was yesterday, and said, oh, but this non-robust feature, the sum of these last, this has high frequency. I think it was you. Uh, and uh, so that was a non-robust feature of high frequency, and I guess that's how you think about it. So, and this non-robust feature is learned last because it has high frequency, so spectral bias, there's a bit of a co connection here too, right? So um, now we can actually see all this, unlike, and the other things where we didn't have a good notion of feature and a good notion of what that actually means. Um, right, I, I leave it at that. You can, you can read the paper if, it, if, if, if yeah. it will appear. I want to spend a few more minutes because I don't have that much time, so I'm switching topics, but I'll actually come back to it, hopefully, um, 
uh, NTK practice. So I already, if you think of this as practice, the poisoning attacks, the data distillation, the adversarial robustness distillation, this is already in practice. But let me actually, so there's actually people who really use the NTK, and I was surprised when I started looking at that literature how much they already use it without really thinking about, I don't want to say without understanding, this is not true, but just like by leap of faith, but then they verify. Okay, so let me see what I mean. So one example, NTKs are used for neural architecture search. There's actually at least four papers now. So quickly, neural architecture search, it was particularly, uh, people were particularly excited about it. There was Google had big, big announcements, 2018 roughly, 17 maybe. So when what Google was saying, okay, it's very hard to design a neural nets. You need to put the inductive bias in there, all that stuff. Let's not do this. Let's have a new, let's have AI discover AI or something, or AI tells us. So they had these huge simulations where they had basically search algorithms over all architectures in some smart way. Often it was evolutionary search, so let's add a little bit convolution, let's evolve that convolution, let's see if we get better. And they tried to build, so this is, this was called e effective neural architecture search, so it's one of these papers from the Google group, um, where they basically find this architecture. And it kind of does better than ResNet or something on a certain big data set, right? Okay, so so there was a big, 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 uh, and still is, I mean, there's huge kind of uh, industry of uh, neural architecture search. Um, and the various heuristics, RL-based, evolutionary algorithms, Bayesian kind of, all kinds of stuff. But the point is, each time they do something, they do some search in their big architecture space, and then they need to verify if it's a good architecture or a bad one that they found. That's what they need to do. So they need what they call a validation metric. They need to figure out, right? So we, we search. These are all our architectures, we search these, and then uh, we need to kind of estimate whether it's a good one or a bad one. How do you estimate? Well, you have to usually, you have to train the damn thing. And training this weird com thing with its connections on a big data set is very intensive. So it, it used to take thousands of GPU, what is it called? Hours, I guess, thousands, I mean like days, GPU days, whatever, something. Uh, and so um, uh, this was not so, so good, right? So they, they are trying to find surrogate metrics to evaluate the performance of a neural net, okay, um, on, on their various, and they have to do it many, many times. So there are several uh, papers that are then trying to use the NGK. Uh, one of them, I mean, the first one, I think, no, actually, the first one is by the Google group, uh, which I know least. So they use not the NGK, but the you know, uh, Gaussian process and Monte Carlo sampling. So I know very little about it, but I want to say that this idea already, even the original Google people, this is also with me and without Yasaman for some reason, but never mind. Um, but, <laughs> but this is already, you know, they find a way to use these Gaussian processes with a bit of sampling to approximate how well the neural net might be doing. But uh, what these people do is, remember I told you about this condition number. It is pure heuristic, right? They take their weird architecture that they get, they produce the empirical kernel, the empirical NTK, and then they say, remember what I said? If the condition number is good, if the lowest eigenvalue is large, if this, the ratio is small, then we can train it fast. So let's just use this as our metric. So this is what this paper does. It does, it does a little more, I, I should not say. They do some other stuff, and they find a good kind of validation metric for architecture search. But just literally, there's not, not any, but, but they verify it, right? Because these neural architecture people, they have also created architecture search people. They have created benchmark sets. So they have a big database of, this neural net does this well, this subcomponent does this well, so they can quickly verify, and it turns out this metric is not so bad, this condition number business. Okay, then there is, uh, these people here, they're even more lazy, they say we don't want to invert that matrix, or we don't want to even compute it, and they just use some Frobenius norm or the sum of the entries of the NTK as a proxy. So they don't need to, they don't need to do eigenvalue uh, uh, computations, so they go from n cubed to n squared. And even that kind of works uh, somehow, right? And then there is uh, this paper, it's very recent, uh, which looks at these other two papers and said, ah, oh, you guys, you're not doing so well, let's be a little more sophisticated. Um, and they do something which, again, relates, I will write it down in a second. Uh, so they, they kind of look at it a bit with a critical eye, so that's why they call themselves demystifying the new good potential kernel. Uh, I'm not sure they demystify it that much. But they, they look at that, what the other people did, and say, oh, it's not so great. And then they produce something uh, that is a bit better. 
um, and verifiable in the sense that they verify it on this thousands of examples. So let me just, uh, because it actually relates to all the stuff that we know, let me quickly write it down, what they do. So what they do is, uh, is what we do also in some ways. They look at LGA, and what is LGA? It's labeled gradient alignment. Say. So remember that, uh, again, when we linearize everything and we get our kernel, I think I wrote this at least 50 times already, but I'm going to write it one more time. We get this output x, x, y. Okay. Um, and then, of course, uh, if, the, if this, uh, if f, Right, can be written, or it can be written as a linear, obviously here, I mean, from this we see that it can be written as a linear combination on the data, right? Right, so in other words, uh, this is the, uh, if this is, it, it, it lies in the, in the Hilbert space, in the RKHS, right? So what that means is that the norm in that Hilbert space, of that function f, the norm h in that uh, beautiful Hilbert space, is given by alpha, alpha is the coefficients, alpha, alpha uh, transpose k alpha to the minus one, right? So this is the norm, and uh, you must have, I mean, I, I'm sure you have seen these results that relate the norm of this function to how well it generalizes, right? So this is, uh, it uses bounds from the Rademacher complexity uh, literature in the early 2000s uh, and shows basically that uh, the empirical, um, excuse me, the, the generalization error is bounded. So let me just be very, um, this is, I took this from the Aurora paper. This is Aurora et al. 19, I believe, which bounds the generalization error in terms of the, of this, of this measure here for the labels. Okay, so, um, Oh, sorry, I forgot one step. So if, if the function is a linear combination, then its norm is written like this, and our function is a linear combination of the labels. So the norm of the kernel function, sorry, this was a crucial step that I forgot, is given by the labels. Y transpose K minus one, Y, okay? So in other words, um, the error, the generalization error, or the population error, whatever, um, is given by one more formula in real time f kernel of x minus y right is bounded by and I took this from the paper uh, I don't know where the heck is number two but let's put it there y k to the minus one y okay times trace of k divided by the root goes here n roughly. So in the infinitely wide limit, and then they can make this also precise with some trade-offs with the width, um, the generalization error of this thing, and when it's over the whole data set, is bounded by, of course it goes with the number of data points, as well as square root n, but the thing that, uh, kind of the generalization bound you get when you do the usual complexity theoretic, in this case Rademacher um, complexity, tricks, um, goes like this, and the trace of the kernel is order n, is order n, let's see if I wrote this correct, um, yes, and so, oh, sorry, this is important, this is outside, um, I apologize, so this is important because then we get that this is basically bounded by an order of magnitude, it goes like y transpose k to the minus 1 y over square root n. So this is how it is. So again, this theorem is derived in this paper for a two-layer neural network 
with all kinds of asymptotic, as, I mean, you know, goes, width goes to infinity, and if it doesn't, then there is a correction term, and all that stuff. So for, for sufficiently large widths, in a two-layer neural net, I think with ReLU, if you write everything down, you get this bound. Okay? So this is number one. So these people, I mean, they say, okay, we, we understand this. Forget that it's two-layer. Forget that it's infinitely wide. Let's just ignore this and use this as our metric. Okay? So they basically, moral of the story, they say y transpose k to the minus 1 y could be a good metric. All right? Because it kind of controls how you generalize, at least in this case. Okay, and this is not very. Oops. I'm having trouble seeing how the the, the two norms, uh, the, the two norms of f are in fact the same. Um, it seems like alpha is k inverse times y. If you plug that into the formula, sort of um, like just under the expansion for f, sort of on the left. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Then you'd actually get a k to the minus three in the upper right. Oh, I see. Well, the thing. You know, maybe. Let's let's take it offline because I do want to get to something, but this is the bound they derive. Let's put it this way. Okay? And maybe you can derive a general bound for any architecture. Is that what you're saying? Well, I, I, I'm wondering, could it be that uh, uh, actually the, the thing um, like right in front of you should be, the, uh, should be alpha transpose k to the positive one times alpha? No. No. This I, I no. No. This is actually what it is. Uh, and I'm happy to, you know, go back then and, and look what it is. No, I actually checked, and this is also important. Uh, so that's one thing, right? So these people say, okay, this is important, but it's kind of no, not so practical, this thing. I mean, it's k minus one, you know, one k minus one. And the other thing they observe is, remember when we wrote down the training error, at the I wrote it many times, so I'm not gonna, the error during training. So when you have the ft, right, when the neural net still trains of x on the training data, this is training, okay, training, right? Remember, I bounded it in, in, in terms of the eigen spectrum, but in particular, this training error, you can bound it by, uh, if you do a Taylor expansion, it's basically, again, up to uh, certain terms, it's bounded, there's maybe one over n here, but it doesn't matter, but the point is, it's bounded by something that goes with the uh, y transpose k y. So remember, I wrote down, when we did this thing, when I said, the labels are not mixed up on MNIST, we project well, and the labels are mixed up, we have this notch. So the, the thing we looked at at the time was simply when you write down the gradient flow, you get this expression that bounds the trainability of the neural net. Okay, so that's the expression that bounds the training error. So they observed that yt, k, y is also good, but we want this one to be small, right? We want this one to be small, and we want this one to be small, obviously, because we want to generalize well, we want to train well, and then luckily we have Jensen's inequality, so they don't have to look at a lot of things. Mm -hmm. But what they say, and this is correct, um, if uh, let's assume y is of norm one, L2, it, it works in all cases, but just I, I want to write down uh, relatively fast. So Jensen's inequality, of course, says if you have a normalized vector, Let's say this is normalized. Ky to the minus one, right? This is a convex function. Uh, is upper bounded by y t ky. Jensen's inequality, right? Jensen. Because one over x is a convex function. Can you read this? So what it says is you can invert the kernel. Oh yeah, you're absolutely right. It's there. Let me write this. This is what it is. So. Inverting the thing or inverting the kernel by Jensen's inequality, one is a bound of the other. Okay? And when you plug in the actual norms, what you're going to get here is if you unnormalize the thing, here you get norm of y squared inside the minus one, and here you get the norm of y squared outside. Okay? You can just do it. You know, you just normalize. I mean, it's just basically the normalization. Okay, so they use this and say, okay, so what we really want, and they're right, is uh, we want a smaller generalization, so small of this by this inequality also implies small of this, which implies, and everything goes the right way, uh, larger trading speed. So anyway, if you look at all these expressions, moral of the story, all you need to look at is the thing 
We want this to be small. And if this is small, it will both generalize well and it will train fast. Okay, and it's kind of intuitive. Why is it kind of intuitive? That's the last thing I'll write and then the rest is just talking. So why is this a good expression? Mm -hmm. So what, what do we have here? Just quickly step back. Here's our kernel. Kernel, right? XX. Kernel. Here's our kernel matrix. Uh, all these various x's. And then we have this y. So writing down this, this thing here, there's another way to write it. I could also write y, y transpose. So this is a vector, this is a vector. So what this thing does is the entry xx prime, y, y transpose, the entry in the xx prime place here, right, simply says, it's, uh, let's assume it's plus minus one. It will be plus one if uh, yx equal yx prime. If they have the same label, and otherwise it will be minus one if they have different labels. Right? So this matrix here is basically a big label matrix. And for every entry it says, are we in the same label or in the different label? It's a binary label. Do you need a trace or something in front of that? Because the left, like you started with yeah. us. No, you start with a scalar, y transpose ky. Then no, this is all. So let, let, let's, I will say what this, this is all the question is, what is this? Yeah. So this, what, this is a matrix, this is a matrix, and we take pointwise in a product. So oh, okay. point by point, yeah, so I don't know what the symbol is for this, maybe this, I don't know what people use. So what I mean by here, by this, this is equivalent in the sense that I can write it like this and take the pointwise in a product, right? So the first entry of this, the first entry of this, second, third, and all these other products, this, this is equivalent. Right? You with me? Okay. And so, yes. I just wanted to understand. If you make the one that's there small, you make the other one big. I don't get. Yeah, so I, I glossed over this. What they want is they want this big because with all the normalizations, it shows how fast you train. Let me gloss over this and, and I can show you so the you precise. Want big. <laughs> we want this big and this small. Okay, just below it says small. Yes, so I should then say um, we want this. If you make that one small, the other one becomes big. big. So, okay. big. so um, right. Anyway, let me just give you the last intuition. These are the labels. So this matrix tells which labels are aligned and which ones aren't. And what is the kernel? The kernel tells me if the two gradients are aligned or aren't aligned, right? So this thing, when is it large? It's large, then whatever there is is a one, also, the two gradients are aligned, right? So it kind of, the, the reason it's called label gradient alignment is because it kind of measures how the gradients are aligned for the right classes and misaligned for the other two classes, right? It makes sense intuitively, right? And that's also now makes perhaps sense why this stuff measures certain things, right? If I'm well aligned, then I kind of have already learned and I generalize well. I mean, again, this is all can be, you look at the theorems, but with this kind of picture in mind, um, maybe they are more probable, at least. All right, so this, that's why I say it's not so stupid to use this, I find, as a metric, because of all these kind of heuristics. And that's what they do. Right? They literally take the NTK after, you know, just that initialization. Maybe they train a tiny bit. And then they compute that thing, and they say, we take the one with the best. This is the architecture we take. Because that means it generalizes best, it trains best, and generally it's a good thing. So it's been used for this. It's been used for model selection. What's model selection? Um, there's a big industry, for instance, for medical, um, medical neural nets and medical imaging, uh, where they don't want to train their nets, obviously. I mean, these nets are pre-trained, they're huge. So they have lots of boxes, off-the-shelf stuff that they can use, and they're asking, which of these many tools that are available should I use? Should I use a pre-trained ResNet 50, or should I use a VGG, or should I use this? for my particular image, net, image set, whatever, my uh, lung x-rays or something, whatever they do. I mean, and seriously, this is, I, I work quite a bit with the medical school and that's what they do. I mean, they, they basically go and say, Julia, which is the neural net I should be using, right? And so there's actually a lot of research on model selection. Which off-the-shelf tool should you use? And you usually don't want to just start fine-tuning. I mean, that's fine. Usually what they do is they take a big pre-trained model and then they just fine-tune. Either they train all the weights a little bit or just the last layer. That's what they do, right? I mean, that's really big industry. And so um, they want to know which best off the shelf. And again, there's a, 
a paper that evaluated lots of metrics exist, what you should be using. Uh, and here again, they use the empirical NTK and they compute for a few samples of your lung x-ray, the data set you want to analyze. They compute this kernel, what is it called, label gradient alignment thing, which is easy to compute for a few, like they take 25 images or something, 25 by 25 matrix. They compute this and they take the one model that has the best uh, value. And sometimes they train it for a few steps because they don't want to take the NTK at initialization. They want to take the NTK after a bit of training. But it turns out it's kind of one of the best metrics there in that area. <coughs> pruning. OK, I really literally only have five minutes. Uh, pruning is also a field where NTK is being started. And it's the same spirit, right? You have a neural net, and you want to know which weight should I prune. So you have a big search space, and you want to use the NTK to guide you in your search. So just that I want to point out that there are studies that use uh, NTKs to have them guide, again, as a surrogate metric to figure out what should I prune in my next step when you do some lit uh, iterative magnitude pruning. This is just to show you that pruning has a long history. Uh, and and the, some of the first papers were uh, actually you know, written by people who spoke in this, uh, Jan and, and Sarah uh, Sola, like optimal brain damage, probably everybody heard of that paper. It's just basically you train a neural net and then you ask which of these connections can I cut, which of the weights are useless. You look at the Hessian and you cut the ones with the smallest second derivative in the diagonal. That's this optimal brain damage, works quite well, but you have to train a net, not so great. The question here is, what do you cut if you don't want to train the thing to convergence, right? And there's, again, they use these surrogate metrics through the NTK. Here is a cute paper for those who like, uh, this is more in the Boris Yasserman spirit. This is a paper that shows if you take a big neural net, fully connected, and you randomly cut a 1 minus p fraction, so you cut a weight with probability 1 minus p, okay? Then you still get NTK dynamics uh, by, re it's, it's equivalent to an NTK where you rescale your weights by 1 over square root p. It's cute. Just wanted to point out. This appeared literally like, I don't know, a few months ago. Um, empirical studies. So maybe I'll take three, three more minutes. Um, and some people have asked yesterday, okay, so what happens with the empirical NTK, right? So what if I linearize my uh, neural net at initialization around the parameters and compute that empirical NTK? And sometimes people do this a few times on average over these initializations. How does that describe anything? And you know, Yasaman has done, I don't know if your perturbations concern this, but, and, and there are many ways to do it, but there are three papers that I find do quite careful studies of various aspects of the linearization uh, of the NTK. Um, so the first one, uh, it's by Ford et al. Um, that's, uh, that's a group at Stanford, I think. The Ganguly and, uh, and so on. Um, and they really study, I mean, they do a lot. It's a big study. They study the landscape and so on. But um, they study the, the empirical kernel. In particular, they linearize at various epochs. So they take the kernel at the beginning, or they first train the neural net and then take the, the empirical kernel. And they ask, when can, what happens to that kernel, the empirical kernel during training? How does it evolve? Okay? And, and they do this for standard ones. So in the regime where the learning rate is the one that is used you know, in practice, so to speak. And what they find, and there's lots, I mean, there's lots of pretty pictures, and this is empirical, they find that this NTK in some metric, and I'll show two, two three pictures, it rotates rather quickly. So kind of, if you think of this picture here, it kind of tries to align itself with the labels pretty quickly. And then after it's done, it kind of stabilizes, and then it's just kind of in a linear regime, so to speak, it grows, but it doesn't, um, doesn't do so much. And they kind of substantiate this by training a little bit, training 10% or 15% of the time, then they linearize and then they continue with the kernel. They continue linearly, and they're pretty much within vicinity of where they would be had they trained with the full neural net. That was, I think, to your question maybe yesterday. So it's a cute paper. I, 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 another study uh, is by, these are the people, I think this is in Canada, Mila and so on, if I'm not mistaken. Um, this is also very cute and uh, tries to relate a little bit again to, to the alignment that I mentioned. Uh, and then they, they, def they look at the complexity that comes from it and, and try to see if there is an inductive bias. Again, I don't want to go into it, I just want to point you to that paper. And then there is this paper by 
These are EPFL people in Nikos, is this correct? Yeah. Or is the other way around? Yeah. These are the, these are the yeah. Canadian, the other one EPFL, never mind. Anyway, just to say, um, so what they do is they again study this type of alignment uh, and they study also the eigenspectrum of this NTK, the empirical one, during evolution. And they observe, for instance, that uh, uh, the rank of that NTK, if there's some, some notion of effective rank, decreases during training. So it's an NTK that starts uh, and then it decreases. So it kind of, it, it focuses kind of on the top eigenvalues, so to speak. I don't know how to say, in, in, you know, in interplay with the data. And then it starts slowly increasing again. So it kind of, uh, you know, it, it shows also what it learns first, what it learns last. Again, there's lots to say about this, and I don't want to go much over time. I just want to show a pretty picture. Uh, this is actually a picture Nikos made, but it's basically they could have made it. This is from the, uh, what the Ford et al. people were looking at. So they take this empirical kernel during evolution, and they look at the angle between two kernels. And the two kernels that they look at is the kernel after, say, 50 epochs and the kernel after 100 epochs, right? And then blue color means hasn't changed much, and the more it goes into this color scheme, the more it changes, right? So what it shows here, hopefully, is that the kernel changes a lot in the beginning, the angle, kind of what I meant by when I said it rotates a lot. So it rotates a lot in the beginning, this NTK, and then it kind of relaxes in terms of rotation. I mean, there's lots of effects here. But to disentangle this, and what just for kicks, what Nikos, and, um, what Nikos did, I should say, is the same during adversarial training. So if you train adversarially, you can still look at the empirical NTK during adversarial training, and we observe that things accelerate a lot. So the thing rotates much faster, but it's also done much faster. So Nikos said the, uh, um, the adversarially trained kernel becomes lazy much earlier. For those people who do lazy you know, versus feature learning, uh, it seems to be the case that you become lazy earlier when you do adversarial training. And I guess you can reason why this is the case. Um, here's a picture of how it rotates and then what it does. So color encodes time. So it starts dark and it gets yellow. And here's standard training. So it rotates really fast, does its angle, and then it just expands. And there's adversarial one, rotates much faster because the color is much longer blue rotates more, but then it kind of is much more lazy. So it does a lot of work in the beginning and then relaxes. I'm sorry, it's all right. Um, this is not very fast. So eigenspectrum. So we see during training, as I mentioned, uh, I'm being very vague, okay? So the concentration on the top eigenvalues uh, kind of during adversarial training, let, let, let's say the top, uh, the, the, the take home message is that uh, the adversarial um, kernel has much more weight at the top eigenvalues. And remember, we, said, we saw that the robust features are lying at the top. So it's kind of clear that then the kernel should focus on these top features. I'm being very big, okay? Don't kill me on the math. Uh, last one, I think. Yes. The last one is we looked at the kernel matrices, just the kernel matrices at the end of training. This is the, I'm sorry, at the end of the beginning. So this is the initial kernel, and we ordered the data. This is, um, I don't know if, what is this, MNIST? Nikos is MS, right? Um, so here we ordered the data, all the zeros, all the ones, all the twos, and we look at the gradient overlaps, right? And you see these clusters of data. And then this is during standard training, and this is during adversarial training. And look at the scale. So this is much bigger than this. So what we see is that the norm, this is the norm of the kernel. During standard training, blue, it grows much more than during adversarial training. But it's not so surprising because the adversarial uh, kernel wants to, doesn't want to really align fully to not be fooled, right? It wants to respect these boundaries. So it kind of doesn't dare to align fully and so the, all these entries are smaller. Did I say this right? Because I keep being mixed up. But basically, that kernel has much less norm evolution than the other one. I think I want to stop here. Um, and I didn't get to, I wanted to show you Hamiltonian neural nets just to show you something about the inductive bias to come back to what I did in the beginning. Um, but I won't do it, uh, but it's, if you ever look at the Hamiltonian neural net paper, I think it's worth a read, it's very simple. Um, but the message here is, um, coming back to my triangle, um, everything depends on the data in many ways, right? And we've seen this here with robustness and so on, and the inductive biases, and it's worth to you know, study this interplay also with a view on the data. I think maybe that's the take-home message. Thank you.